Good morning, and welcome to the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. Today, it's time to announce the prize in economic sciences. This prize is uh, funded by the Central Bank of Sweden, the Sveriges Riksbank, and awarded by the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences in memory of Alfred Nobel. And this award is the 48th uh, since its conception in 1969. I am Göran Hansson, I'm the Secretary General of the Academy, and with me today is on my left Professor Per Strömberg, who is the Chairman of the Economics Prize Committee, and on my right side Professor Thomas Sjöström, who is a member of the committee and an expert in the field of this year's prize. This year's prize is about contracts. Årets ekonomipris handlar om kontrakt. Kungliga vetenskapsakademin har beslutat att utdela Sveriges Riksbanks pris i ekonomisk vetenskap till Alfred Nobels minne för år 2016 till Oliver Hart och Bengt Holmström för deras bidrag till kontraktsteorin. The Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences has decided to award the Sveriges Riksbank Prize in Economic Sciences in memory of Alfred Nobel for 2016 to Oliver Hart and Bengt Holmström for their contributions to contract theory. Uh, you can see uh, the new uh, laureates on the screen above me. Uh, Oliver Hart was born 1948 in London, but he has worked in the United States since the 1980s, and he's currently the Andrew Fuhrer Professor of Economics at Harvard University in Cambridge, Massachusetts, in the US. Bengt Holmström was born in 1949 in Helsinki in Finland, uh, but he has had his career in the United States. He is the Paul Samuelson Professor of Economics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, also in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, he is a foreign member of our academy, but he has not participated in any aspect of the prize work or the academy's work in general in recent years. That was the announcement, and we will now hear more about our new laureates and their work from Professor Per Strömberg of the Economics Prize Committee. Per, Thank you, please. Jan. So this prize is about contracts, and contracts is really a very fundamental phenomenon that I think affects all of us uh, in society. Um, Probably most of us have some kind of insurance for property, for our car or for our house. That means we've entered an insurance contract with an insurance company. Uh, all of us, or many of us at least, has borrowed to buy this house or car, which means we have a loan contract with a bank that we're a party to. When we bought our house or car, we wrote the purchasing contract with the seller uh, of, this, of this property. Uh, and if we have a job, we probably have an employment contract with our employer. Okay? So all of us are affected by contracts. And actually, contracts is broader than this, because many phenomena, many institutions we see in society uh, are actually a contract or can be analyzed with contract theory. So for example, when we own something, when we have property rights to something, that's a type of contract that says what we can do with our property. If we, um, you know, the political constitution in the country uh, is a type of contract between the state and the citizens of that country. So this is very fundamental, uh, and the theories that Hart and Holmstrom have, have developed are uh, incredibly important for us to understand these types of contracts and institutions. So um, one aspect of contracts that um, you know, a lot of us uh, um, think about when we think about contracts is that they're about you know, sharing financial returns from some cooperation. Okay? So it basically says if we have a contract, who should pay whom, when, and how much. Okay? Now, um, 
from a theoretical standpoint, you can think about these as what we call a principal and agent problem. Okay, so a principal would be, for example, if we think about an employment contract, the principal would be the employer who hires someone to do some job. So the person who's hired is the agent. The agent is supposed to do some job uh, on behalf of the principal. And what you have to do is design a contract, a compensation for this agent that is sort of designed in the best way. Um, and it turns out these contracts typically have to balance two different forces. Okay? So the first one is that since the principal, since the employer doesn't necessarily see what the agent or the employee is doing all the time, you have to have a contract that gives incentives for this agent to act in the interest of this principal, okay? to get the incentive part. But the other part which is in conflict with this sometimes is that you don't want to put too much risk on the agent. Okay? The employee is not going to be very happy if the pay you know, goes up and down and fluctuates all the time. So you also want to provide some risk sharing, some insurance to this agent. So if we take an uh, insurance contract, for example, okay, we would love if the insurance company fully covered our losses if we have an accident or if our house burns down. We would like to get everything covered so we have no risk. But the problem is that that's going to give us the wrong incentives potentially because you know, if we know we're fully covered, we're not going to take as well care of our property as we otherwise would have. That's why we have you know, deductibles and co-payments, right? We have to pay a little bit ourselves if we have a loss. The insurance company doesn't, uh, doesn't cover everything. And that's to give us the right incentives to be careful. Okay? So risk versus incentives. So this is where Bengt Holmström's contributions are uh, in understanding this principal agent problem and how to design contracts. So this is an old problem. I mean, already Adam Smith talked about you know, the principal agent problem. But this um, research really took off thanks to Bengt Holmström's contributions in the starting in the late, 90, uh, late 1970s uh, and onwards. And he basically has a number of uh, different research contributions that highlights all sorts of different important aspects of how to do these contracts. What information do you want to pay base performance on? What do you do when an agent has to be incentivized to do too many, to, to, uh, lots of different things, not just one thing? Uh, how do you incentivize a team? You know, so maybe people are working together to produce something. Um, how do you think about giving the right incentives over time? For example, how does your future career prospects affect your incentives to work today? Okay. So to be a little bit more concrete, let's think about an example that I think a lot of people are familiar with. How do we pay managers and CEOs of big companies? Okay. So this is a principal agent problem. The principal are you know, the shareholders. Okay, they want the, to hire this agent, this CEO, to act in their interest, to create as much value for the shareholders as possible, for example. So it turns out you can apply Holmstrom's different theories on lots of aspects of, of this problem. So for example, the informativeness principle, which is a famous uh, result of Holmstrom, that talks about how, you know, what information should you base, say, the bonus on. Okay? One implication of that, for example, is that it might seem natural to reward a CEO if the profits of their company is high, okay? but that means that's not the full story because if we just base bonus on the profits of the own company, then we're going to be paying the CEO in many times just because be they're being lucky or punish them because they're unlucky. So if you run an oil company, you might be more profitable just because the oil price goes up. That's just luck. We don't want to reward the CEO for that. Okay? So that's an implication uh, of the informativeness principle. Another um, natural example is that you know, a CEO needs to do many different things to create value in a company. So for example, they, we might want them to really make sure that this year's profits are high. But we might also want to make sure that they take the best long-run decisions in the company. You know, we invest in, let's say, R&D or long-term investments where the profits may show up you know, long, far into the future. Okay? So how do you balance these incentives for you know, this year's profits versus long-term uh, value for the company? And one interesting uh, finding here is that you know, typically it's easier to measure profits today compared to long-run value. Okay? So there's a temptation to base the bonus on the thing you can observe or easiest measure, right? The profits today. But that has a problem because if you only base the 
the bonus on today's profits, then maybe everything that the CEO will focus on is just this year's profits and forget about long run investments that are important for the firm. So in that situation, maybe you can't have any bonus at all, not even on short term profits, if you want to have the right balance with incentives. And the third example uh, is this career concerns model of Holmstrom, which basically says that when you're young, you get an incentive even if you don't have a bonus, you have an incentive to do the right thing because you might get promoted and get a pay raise in the future. But this also tells you that if you think about a CEO, maybe having a big bonus or performance pay is much more important when they're getting old <laughs> and closer to retirement compared to when they're young and are incentivized by future career prospects. So that sort of summarizes Bank Holmstrom's contribution. Now, Oliver Hart uh, introduced another uh, aspect of contracting that turned out to be very important and useful, which has to do with incomplete contracts. Okay? So, if we look at a contract, it just doesn't just specify you know, payments between people, but it also says who should have the right to decide on things in this cooperation. Okay? Um, now, th why are these decision rights in these contracts? Well, it has to do with the fact that you can't specify everything in a contract. It will become impossible, you know? They, they'll become larger than that one, <laughs> okay? There's so many things that can happen in the future that we can't even imagine and write down what will happen in the contract. So when we can't do that, then we have to say, okay, what happens if something unexpected or unspecified happens? Who has the right to decide what to do then, okay? That's where these decision rights come in. So what contracts also do is that they decide who should, or, or they allocate these decision rights between the contracting parties. Who has the right to make the decision when we haven't specified it beforehand? And this is really what co uh, incomplete contracting theory is about. So again, there were sort of informal arguments of how to understand decision rights, ownership, property rights in this context, but there wasn't any formal theory before Oliver Hart and his co-authors developed this starting in the mid-1980s. Um, and um, the idea here, again, is that when contracts are incomplete, you haven't specified anything, then you have to write down who has the right to make the decision okay, of what to do. Now, Having the right to make the decision, that gives you power, okay? And that power helps you actually capture a bigger piece of the cake in your relationship, okay? So if you have the right to decide, if you own the asset, then you're going to get a bigger reward from the cooperation. And that, in turn, affects your incentives to, for example, invest uh, in this relationship. So this is sort of the, the gist of the theory. They first applied it to the question of whether a firm should own its supplier or not. Okay, so that's called vertical integration. But it just turned out this is an incredibly rich theory to explain many, many different things. So to give you some examples, this theory was applied to understand, you know, what is really the difference between the firm and the market, okay? What kind of transactions, economic transactions, should better take place within firms and which ones should uh, occur in markets? It has been applied to understand this financial contracting problem, okay? If we want to borrow or get money from an investor, how do we write, specify the decision rights in that relationship? Uh, it can be applied to organization design. So who should have the right to decide? Should the boss decide on everything or should you delegate more to the employees? That's a problem you can analyze with this theory. Uh, and the last one, which I'm going to spend a little bit more time on, is the issue of privatization. Okay? So let's say a government wants some public service to be provided. We can think about a prison or you know, a healthcare hospital or a school or uh, you know, garbage collection. Okay? Should the government own this service provider or should you write the contract with a private service provider? Okay? Now, without incomplete contracting theory, you really can't think about ownership. Because, so let's say that the uh, government wants to get both high quality of this service, but they also want cost efficiency. You don't want to spend too much taxpayers' money on getting this service. So you have these two goals. Now let's say you could measure some you know, quality and you could measure costs. Well, then you would just write a, a pay performance contract that gives, you know, pays the provider more if quality is high and costs are low and less otherwise. Now, in this world, it doesn't matter who owns it. You could have a government employee that has the same 
pay performance contract as, let's say, a private provider. Okay? So to get ownership to matter, you really have to be in a world where contracts are incomplete. You can't exactly specify in a contract what good quality is, okay? for example. Um, so this gives a role for ownership, and it's going to be very different than if the government owns the service provider or if it's a private service provider that you, you pay to do the service. So in general, it's very hard if you have a government-owned service to provide good incentives for either for cost-cutting or quality, um, because it's very hard to credibly reward government employees for, for cutting costs or improving quality. Now, that doesn't mean that private ownership is always better. So Hart's model really tells you which type of factors go in the direction of public or private ownership. So, for example, uh, in a situation where cost reductions can really hurt quality, okay, well, that would push you more towards public ownership. Um, if innovations, future innovations to improve quality of services are really important and very hard to specify, well, that factor tends to move in the direction of, of private ownership in this model. And how competitive a private market will be also turns out to be very important. If competition is not expected to work very well, well, then that goes in the direction of public ownership. So this isn't a model that says that one thing is always better than the other, but it tells you that maybe you know, garbage collection has a different optimal setup than, let's say, uh, a prison. Okay. So to conclude, um, this theory has really uh, been incredibly important, not just for economics, but also for other social sciences. So everything ranging from corporate governance and firms to you know, constitutional law and, and politics can be analyzed with these kind of tools. And thanks to their uh, research, we now have can analyze not just you know, financial terms, you know, who should get paid what, but also these control and decision rights, ownership, property rights, uh, and, and other types of decision rights and contracts. And this theory is both positive, as we call it, which means you can explain the type of contracts we see in society, but it's also normative. It can actually help us write better contracts, both in public policy and in private markets. So that's it. Thank you, Peter. Now, uh, we, at this stage, we may have uh, one of our laureates with us on the phone line, Professor Bengt Holmström. Uh, good morning, Professor Holmström. Are you there? Good morning. I'm here. Very good. This is Joran Hansen of the Academy again. And uh, since we spoke an hour ago, I have moved to our press conference and announced the prize to you and, and Dr. Hart. Um, are you ready to take some questions from the journalists? Yes. Would it be okay in Swedish as well as in English? That's okay. Very good. Who would like to start? Please. I'll, I'll take it in, in English. Um, congratulations. H how did you react when you got the call from Stockholm about an hour ago? Well, I, 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 I was late, <laughs> like most prize winners. Very surprised. I'm very happy. More questions? Yeah, please Could go I ahead. Could I take another one? Um, uh, you have studied, uh, you have done research on contracts. Uh, could I ask you about bonuses for CEOs? What do you think? Should you give big bonuses to CEOs? Well, in, uh, in economics, we don't, we don't really take a stand on the size of the, uh, of the, size of the bonuses. So they, they seem extraordinarily high. Uh, but uh, my, th my theories don't take a take a stand on that as much as it studies the question about what, what kind of structure should be used. And, uh, and in this regard, I think uh, my personal view is that they are too complicated today and that, uh, and that uh, on the other hand, what has been improved in late years is, is, is the West, what, what's called the vesting, meaning that, uh, that they don't get everything in, in, in a very short period, they get things over time. And, and so, uh, but it's a very complicated problem. And uh, one last question. How do you feel right now? Uh, I feel very lucky and grateful. 
to the committee and my colleagues and the co-authors and family and everybody. More questions? Gentleman over there. Hej, Jens Bernorsson från TV4 Nyheter. Jag tänkte prova på svenska Bengt Holmström. Går det bra? Det går bra. Till att med ska vi säga grattis. Du har ju suttit i Nokia styrelse. Är det viktigt för forskare att få erfarenheter från det privata näringslivet på det sätt som du har fått? För mig har det varit i hela mitt liv viktigt att vara nära näringslivet. Och jag, jag, bör, jag börjar ju inte som en akademiker utan jag börjar, som en, jag börjar arbeta på Alström i Finland och, och, och det var där jag blev intresserad av de här incitamentproblemen. Så att jag har inte hela mitt liv varit och haft en liten, liten del av mig själv i, i, i näringslivet, i styrelser och, och, och sen har min hustru har ett familjeföretag också där jag har varit, varit i, i styrelsen. Så att, eh, jag, tar, jag tar mycket inspiration från, från, från det här världsliga livet så att säga. När du har forskat på kontraktsteori, vad, vad kunde du ta med dig därifrån in i näringslivet? Ja, det de, de nämndes just de här bonusarna för, för, för det där eh, bonusarna för de här eh, bachelandirektören och andra människor. Så, så, eh, så det, är ju, det är ju det där, eh, det är ju en konkret fråga, men, men man kan säga nästan hela, hela den här företagsstrukturen och organisationen och annat. Incitament är inte alls bara de här pengarna man betalar, utan det är hur den här organisationsformen man använder. Man ska ni hörde om Oliver Haas teori, om, om vem har beslutsrätt här och så vidare. Så det här, det här är ett stort system, det här incitamentsproblematiken, som påverkar all, alla, alla strukturer. Slutligen, det är ju inte bara ära att få ekonomipriset, det är ju en stor säck pengar som följer med det också. Vad tänker du göra med pengarna? Det har jag inte funderat på faktiskt. Det, det, är den sista, det är den sista saken jag tänker på. <laughs> Tack så mycket. Tack. Lady over there, can you access? Uh, hi, uh, congratulations. Uh, I'm Sufitian Axelsson from uh, Green Post and CRI Freelance. Uh, I just like to ask you, did you ever expect this or ever think of You will win the Nobel Prize. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, you know, this, this profession and, and, and being in Cranbys, obviously people talk about it. And I would say other people have talked about it. But uh, no, the short answer is I certainly did not expect it. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, to, uh, at least, at least uh, you know, at this time. So I was very surprised. And I'm, I'm very happy, of course. But I, I, th I think most people, when one hears the reactions, is, uh, is sort of a sense of, of, of things being surreal. Okay. Thanks. Please. Pio Anschik from Dagens Nyheter. Congratulations. Uh, I have a question concerning context theory, and that is uh, um, when you look at the incentives for uh, the agent, uh, do you think there's a difference between the, if the principle is only shareholders, owners, or if it, uh, they are stakeholders, uh, including different parts it, in society? Yes, it would be, it would make a difference uh, 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 in the sense that, you know, people that, people who get to decide incentives uh, look at them from their own angle, but, uh, but one of the important lessons from contract theory is that whatever contract you write, you always have to think about the other parties involved as well. So, uh, so uh, you have to look at it br more broadly than just look at it, you know, from the uh, point of view of the shareholder. The shareholder, when he is or she is maximizing the uh, own benefit, uh, also has to think about, uh, about all the other parties that are involved. So it's not, it's not, uh, it, 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 what we in, in economics call, you know, we are trying to maximize the total pie, meaning uh, get it to be a win-win situation for everybody. Thank you. The gentleman with the big camera over there. David Keaton, Associated Press. Uh, so the panel explained your work and the word incentives uh, came back frequently. May I ask you, what um, was the incentive to begin research in this area? 
And what incentive will this Nobel Prize bring you, sir? Well, uh, on the first question, the incentive to study this came from uh, actually first working before I became an academic. It was incidental that I became an academic. I went to Stanford for a one-year one year cultural exchange uh, exchange uh, stipend. And, uh, and I had realized that in the 70s, you know, the company I was working for, uh, uh, they tried to they tried to use computers to decide how the company should uh, make its decisions and make its strategic plans and 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 that's when I realized that the issue wasn't really about you know the difficulty of coming up with the best plan. The bigger issue was also to create incentives for people to give the right in information that is needed for these plans and and incentivize them in general. So that's the origins of the idea. And I was very lucky that this happened to be an interest in economics at the same time when I came to Stanford. Thank you. Are there more questions? Yes, oh, please. Uh, gratulerar Bengt Holmström, uh, Joakim Voxer från TT här, Nysbyrån. Uh, jag skulle vilja fråga, när man har studerat kontraktsteori så här uh, i detalj, blir man bättre på att skriva kontrakt då? Hur är det med dina egna kontrakt? <laughs> det är en bra fråga för det, det, vi, vi är ekonomer överlag och det här är, inte, är någonting som folk förstår kanske inte. Vi tänker på ett annat sätt och, och, och många saker som verkar mycket motstridiga eller, eller, eller konstiga i, 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 i vårt tänkande och i världen så, så, så det bygger på en lång, lång, långsiktig logik som vi har funderat och, 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 på. Så i den meningen är det väldigt vetenskapligt. Ibland jämför jag det med det Copernicus som äh, människorna säger att, att solen går runt jorden men vi ekonomer vet att det är jorden som går runt solen. Mm. <coughs> Getting a bit worrying there. <laughs> Last question, brief question from the lady over there. Yes, hello, congratulations uh, Mr. Holmström. Uh, Louise Sandin Mitten from Svenska Dagbladet Stockholm. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first is, uh, with your way of thinking about contracts, could, how could that be applied to uh, political situations as for the, um, say, for the upcoming US election now uh, between a politician and then a large number of people, uh, all the citizens? And the, the second question is uh, whether you, if you do have an idea, but um, um, coming up from uh, your early experience with Nokia and now in Sweden with Ericsson having some troubles. Um, do you see, could it, has there been, um, can, can your uh, research sort of explain what has happened in these companies in any way? I wouldn't call that yes, a I mean, the, the, the poli the, let me take the first question because it's more creative in some sense. You know, that uh, relates to the political incentives. So, so uh, they mentioned my work on career concerns. That is, a, that, is a, that is work that applies very much to, to a broad range of things. So, but it's not about money. It is about what people's ambitions are and the motivations for why they are doing things. And, and there, you know, such things as visibility, if you look at them now, they are all on TV and such. That being on TV and having everybody look at, uh, at them perform, say, this debate, those have both good incentives and bad incentives involved. So, you know, the, the, what we call implicit incentives or, 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 uh, or these motivations, they are very complicated to deal with. And they, they drive bad behavior, they drive good behavior as well. Thank you very much, Professor Holmström. I'm afraid we'll have to stop there. There will be more opportunities to uh, interview Professor Holmström when he comes to Stockholm in December. So thank you very much, and see you in December. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Any quick questions to the panel? If not... Yes, yes, we have reached uh, Oliver Hart, and he was also very happy and pleased, and they, both of them expressed that they were, were, are delighted to be sharing the prize with each other. They uh, are, uh, appreciate each other as uh, colleagues and friends. So, with that, we'll...
close this part of the press conference and now it's time for individual interviews with experts and committee members for those of you who have requested interviews. And then you're all welcome back on, I think, December 7th. Thank you. Professor Per Strömberg, you're the member of the Economic Science Prize Committee. This year's prize in economic sciences is awarded to Oliver Hart and Bengt Holmström for the research in contract theory. Yeah. Why contract theory? Because contract theory, first of all, uh, when you start thinking about it, contracts are really fundamental. We see them everywhere in society. All of us are, are engaged in different types of contracts. Many institutions we see in society, you can also think about contracts like constitutions or property rights and those kind of things. So one thing it's important. The second thing is that this is a theory that really has given rise to lots of other applications. So in many, many fields, not just in economics, but in law, in politics, people actually use these theories to understand uh, you know, what they're studying. Is this a big, big area of research in economic sciences? It's huge. Uh, I would say it's literally huge. And it really started taking off first with you know, this classical contract theory that Bengt Holmström developed uh, and then with the incomplete contracting theory of Oliver Hart. Both of those strands have proven incredibly uh, influential across social sciences. Okay. Uh, please give an example of the value of this type of research, if it can be more concrete. So, um, well, I mentioned two, uh, uh, two examples in the press conference. One is, uh, you know, thinking about how to decide 
pay for, for example, for CEOs in, in firms, you know, how do you balance uh, incentive pay, which makes maybe them be more motivated, but how do you avoid you know, bonuses and incentive pay leading to wrong decisions being made in companies. So the theory is super useful to understand that problem, not just to explain what happens, but actually help uh, shareholders or corporate boards to design better uh, contracts as well. The second example I mentioned was, uh, you know, ownership. Okay, so how do we think about ownership? Does it matter uh, who owns what? Okay, so uh, to be very concrete, privatization, right? Does it matter whether a, a, a provider of public services is owned by the government or owned by a private contractor? Uh, and to understand this problem and the trade-offs there, this theory that Oliver Hart developed in incomplete contracting is absolutely crucial uh, to think about that. Um, has the ordinary consumer like you and me who sometimes uh, sign contracts anything yeah. to learn about this? Yeah. Well, I think we understand, for example, why when we have an insurance for our house and it burns down uh, or we have a loss, why doesn't the insurance company cover everything? Okay. So we would like our, you know, uh, uh, to be fully covered, but we usually have a deductible or a co-payment, okay, that may be the first whatever uh, loss we have to pay ourselves. Uh, and contract theory explains, for example, why that's the case, because if we were fully covered, let's say our car insurance paid for the full value of our car, well, then maybe we wouldn't care about whether we locked the car or not or someone stole it, because, uh, you know, we would anyway get a new car from the insurance company. So these two things... It's just giving us insurance, but also making sure we have the right incentives to be careful. The trade-off between these two things is something we can understand and analyze with contract theory. Do you think the insurance companies are interested in this field of research? I know that insurance companies are hugely interested in this type of research. Actually, a lot of the you know, insurance companies were among the first people, you know, real-world people who really started thinking about uh, contract theory and how to balance insurance and incentives. Uh, and contracts are sometimes broader than just economies, uh, economy and money. Uh, is there any political lessons to be learned about this type of research? There's actually lots of, of political lessons because a lot of political institutions you can think about as contracts between you know, the politicians and the citizens. Uh, and politicians, we believe, are very much affected by incentives. Maybe not, you know, not necessarily monetary incentives. Um, but, you know, career incentives, right? So, for example, this theory uh, tells us how, you know, politicians might have very different uh, motivations at different points in their career, for example. Uh, it could also tell us, you know, what's the best institutional setup? Should we have, you know, power balance between uh, a parliament uh, and, uh, and the government and the... And the high court or, you know, how should we organize these things? So contract theory is very applicable uh, to all of these problems. Interesting. Um, uh, you know this, uh, this person's a little. Please tell us who are Oliver Hart and Bengt Holmström. Tell us about their careers and fields of research. So um, Bengt Holmström uh, is born in Finland, actually speaks Swedish. Uh, uh, he uh, um, moved to Stanford as an exchange student um, and you know, he had, I think, anticipated working in his, uh, you know, in, in, in the business world, but he was interested in, in, in understanding problems that he saw in the business world, problems with, you know, how do you motivate people, you know, how do you get the right corporate culture in the company, and then when he came to Stanford, he was lured into doing research on this, and then ended up, uh, you know, staying in the U.S. Uh, and, and becoming, uh, you know, world-famous researcher on this. Oliver Hart uh, is also um, European. He's born in, in Britain. Uh, he started out actually uh, doing uh, very theoretical uh, work on, on market equilibrium and so on. Um, but he at some point started becoming interested in what ownership was. You know, how should we think about ownership? What is that? Uh, and, and, you know, why do, why do we see ownership and decision rights and contracts? And that really... Uh, switched him to this field of incomplete contracting that you know he became world famous for uh, and was awarded. The... And I just wonder, has the laureates written some books or something that someone can dig into if they're really interested in this um, in the research? So, um, well, they've both written uh, some good sort of overview articles. Actually, together they have a nice overview of, of contract theory. Maybe a bit academic, but 
uh, Oliver Hart has written uh, a few books also on on, uh, on incomplete contract. Yeah? Uh, that's interesting. And on the uh, if you have the the press release, we actually have a few links to interviews and biographies uh, that are more accessible to to non researchers as well. And a final question: Are they happy to about the news? I think they are very happy. Uh, obviously, uh, they're very happy to get the award, but both of them actually emphasized how happy they were to share the prize with the other person. So I think they, uh, they are very pleased uh, right now. Thank you very much, Pastor Mbaye. Thanks.